Hello everyone, this video will be about textures and materials in cycles and the techniques used for the dome environment materials. We've already seen one element, that is the shaders presets containing the BSDFs and the various closing part of the material. We need still to look at two other elements. One is a preset blending operation. Uh, the base blending operation would be mixing two textures together or overlaying dirt map on a color map but there's one specific blending operation connected to using dirt maps that I've made into a node group and that I've used a lot so we see this and also this node group boxes for textures and there are a couple of reasons why a texture in this library is not a single node shift A texture image texture but grouped into these boxes. So let's start with the textures. And I have a test one that works more or less like the other ones, except a few that have three outputs and it's just like having three boxes but all in one. And for one tileable texture material will give you the diffuse, the specular and the bump in one nice box with one parameter for scaling. But, except for that, it's the same you see here. And so inside you can see that there's an image texture with box mapping and a blending parameter and then something that fits into the vector, so the mapping. First, the box mapping, and this was quite important to have for Project Mango. A way to texture objects without even the most basic unwrapping we know that doing a nice unwrap with packing can take a lot of time and yes, doing a quick unwrap like just going to edit mode, smart UV project, done and then putting a tileable texture in it, it's quite fast but we were looking for something even faster and also that wouldn't be based on the object coordinate but let's call it word coordinates so that if I had two instances of the same object next to each other they might have some elements like a dirt map that are unwrapped and so will repeat identical but they also might have something like branch texture and that we want to be different for every instance so just offset slide a bit the texture for two different instances and get different patterns of dirt on these two objects so I have some kind of word coordinates instead of object coordinates so we wanted box mapping with world coordinates. Box mapping wasn't available in cycles during Project Bango until the fourth month when Brecht implemented it as a parameter of this image texture. But luckily Kyoton uh, implemented it by making a group node, a group of nodes way earlier. And that's something that for my part of work in the dome was really lifesaver in some way because I wouldn't have tried it myself like he used a paper by Neil Blavins that explains the technique but it's something that I wouldn't have risked I wouldn't have trusted it would work like putting all those mapping options to have three different planes then blending texture based on the normal uh, channel and everything and I really must thank Yarton for like trusting that that could be done with the base node in cycles uh, not to say that the base node in cycle are not powerful actually it's the opposite uh, if you are very careful and know exactly what you're doing these simple base operations can be reshuffled plugged together in the right way and you can get some effects that are really advanced and it's almost like coding new features just by plugging nodes into each other then of course when Brecht coded this option in the image node itself it's now 50 percent faster but it was really important to have it that early on in the project as a node group and right now it's still only available in tomato branch but hopefully it will be merged into trunk very soon because for a lot of objects in dome uh, it was really important technique to speed up things and make things work in the time available so we won't go uh, over the technique to create the box mapping, we have it here. We just need to have a vector to feed into the image texture that will give the correct mapping. And 
let's look at it first without the box mapping and without all the nodes in between. Okay. So what you see here is straight flat object mapping. The texture is projected from the top onto the objects. And that's the base generic texture you want to start from. Of course, object or generated. Not normal, not UVs, not window, not reflection, that's that's obvious. But between object and generated, they are very similar. But what's the difference? Generated will stretch the texture based on the bounding box of the object. So you look at the dimensions here, you see 4, 0.6, 2, that's the, the bounding box, the physical dimensions of the object, and the texture will be stretched to that. If we use object, we don't get that, but placed in the same place on every object. So then these other nodes you see here are for then correcting this and making it instead from object coordinates to world coordinates. But let's think about the stretching. You can see that if I stretch the object, the texture will be stretched. So generally, if you want box mapping, word based, that will tile your texture in an unstretched, constant way all over your objects, you need to have an object with a scale that is one on every axis, that is uniform scale and to use object because if you use generated you get also the problem that if the object is not square in the bounding box here you can see the bounding box here you can see the scaling two different things there's no way to not stretch textures unless you project them if your object is scaled not uniformly but what you can and I guess you want to get rid of is uh, the stretching if the dimensions are not uniform which of course happens if uh, an object is not a cube or not doesn't have a cube bounding box so we start from object mode and then we have it projected from the top to get it box projected we just switch to box and set an amount of blending which could be even less than this so that if we are blending zero, these bevels or these junction areas, we get seams and even arrows. If we set a minimum amount of blending, we get a bit of blending area. If we set a lot of blending, we get the texture blending everywhere is not a straight vertical or horizontal face. Then let's get back to the thing of having two instances of the object with slightly different texture pattern, slightly offset texture pattern that is having word coordinates, word offset, and these are these nodes. You can see first, like technically about the nodes themselves, these are color mix nodes. Uh, why are they inside a path that is about vector UV coordinates? Because, well, Vector UV coordinates are, they are three values, three numbers, uh, one for X, Y, Z, and so technically they are the same as using RGB data uh, if you want to do math on them. They are not the same, of course, because color data is for coloring your objects, vector data in this case is for uh, mapping your objects. But if you want to do math on them, then you can do it by using these nodes and that's something that Brecht told me and I would have never figured out myself but it's then really easy to tweak object or generated or UV mapping to add some specific features. In this case you plug the object mapping into an add node so you sum the information from object mapping with the location vector of the object 
And what you get is object mapping, but offset by the position of the object. And so you get also this very interesting feature, which might not be what you want if you're planning to animate objects. Of course, if the object moves, the texture will slide. But it's really useful if you're building something in pieces, in different objects, and then you want the texture to be continuous over them. You can see that these two objects have this texture continuous. And so if this was two pieces of a wall, you would get the texture for the bricks be continuous along the two monkeys. And this is one node that is in here. The second thing I wanted to have in this texture presets is this scale, this input factor for the scale. So just again a color operation, in this case a multiply by a factor and if you tweak the factor, the texture will get bigger or smaller. Just like that. Uh, there's a bit of a trick in here. Because you can see there's a value, gray socket value, fitting into a multiply node, which is ex expecting a color value. Uh, how do you do this? Well, uh, it's a bit tricky, but it works. You can first put in a math node or any other node that has a value input and value output. Plug it in. Plug it in here. So that you get in here a value socket. You can delete it and this socket will still be a value socket and you can plug it into a color socket. So this is the way you create exactly the socket you want, which is just a value and which can go above one, that's the point. And you can just specify a number instead of using a color. But then you plug it into the multiply node, which is yeah, supposed to expect uh, color data, but it's instead, in this case, working with vector data and a single value. And basically you are multiplying the vector, the mapping, by a certain constant factor, you multiply x, y, z coordinates by a certain factor, and this way you scale it. By scaling it to 0.1, you make it bigger, and by scaling like 6, 5, you make it smaller. Now, the second item we're going to see in this tutorial is this three steps stencil blending node group. Uh, we've seen the inputs of the material. So the textures, the closing part, the shaders, the BSDF, and in between something will happen. Texture will be blended or tweaked. Generally this happens by basic mix and overlay operations or color ramps, I mean basic nodes, but there's one slightly more complex blending operation that I've put into a node group preset, which is this stencil technique. It's uh, an extended version of normal stenciling technique and it's nothing particularly complex but it's something I like to use a lot in conjunction with dirt maps. A basic stenciling would mean having two textures like for a terrain you would have like sand and grass and a black and white map that you put between the two set to stencil that's how it worked in Blender internal, and then you would have as a result the grass and uh, sand texture blended by this contour map. These three step stencils put instead of two levels, three, based on three main levels in the dirt map black, grey, and white. And the purpose of this node group is to take the dirt map and replace the black, the grey, and the white with three te photo textures, tileable textures and also have some noise, some grunge effect. Now, to say more about this stencil node, we have to look at it using a dirt map, something to feed into the dirt map slot, otherwise this node wouldn't do anything interesting, actually. So I've opened um, a scene with uh, some of the Gribble objects with their baked dirt map, 
and you can see this dirt map is uh, ambient occlusion bake and nothing more being done automatically with no human intervention what I have here is a simplified just a test material with an emission shader to make it easy to render and yeah what we you see now is the uh, actual material that we'll see in the next tutorial the full material but right now I just want to talk about this three step stencil using only the dirt map and okay you can see I've plugged the dirt map into the stencil node group into the dirt map slot and then I have these three colors that allow this will allow me to recolor the dirt map in different ways then generally what you want to do is not just recolor it but plug some photo textures in it so that you get rust metal and the scratches but there's a few more things going on inside the notes are fairly convoluted to look at but they are not doing anything special but remapping the textures so that with blending operation then you can mix the black color with the gray color using the dirt map and then the result of this gets mixed with the white color based on the amount of Y that is in the dirt map and all this node that's what they do these nodes here instead are about black noise and white noise and the grunge effect let's look at that now as you can see this version of the stencil is a bit different than the one that was used in Mango because I've just refined and I'm still thinking about it and trying to find the best way to solve especially the overlaying of grunge on these dirt and edge areas because the question is okay this looks almost good almost okay in the sense that it has a black area that we can consider rust and a white area that we can consider the scratches but it's very uniform it's a gradient and what if we want to add some grunge and some character and some shapes to it like the actual shapes of scratches and here I have a terrible scratches texture that you can plug in in the white noise slot and then as you increase the amount of noise basically the gradient will be partially or almost completely replaced with the grunge texture that you see and let me show you the this is the texture I'm using so basically this texture gets placed this texture gets placed in these white areas of the material and to do that I tell the node tree to mix the dirt map with this noise map only in a certain area by a certain amount and then the tricky part is just balancing this effect so that you get something that doesn't cover completely the gradient around the edges but also gives it enough variation and you can actually see the, these shapes of scratches which of course also need to have the right size to make sense for the object we can see it maybe even better if I exaggerate the colors so, amount zero we get a gradient which is correct in some way because you have like the metal 
the paint on the metal getting thinner and thinner as we get close to the edges of the object but it's a bit too uniform and as we increase this amount it gets blended with the texture and so you get some actual scratches but you still get some of the gradient effect this is about all for this tutorial in the next one we're going to see these node groups put in practical use in a sample material using the gribble kits from project mango to showcase this type of materials and then we'll see better about the use of the stencil uh, i also didn't go into too much detail about the blending operations i shared a node so you can open it and tear it apart and see how it works but keep in mind that these color ramps and math nodes and multiply nodes i've already tweaked it a bit since project mango and i will probably tweak it more just to balance the amount of grunge effects and everything and also a note about the efficiency and the performance of these techniques Using tileables and blending many textures, like for this material, that is the material for this kit of object, instead of having one flat texture for diffuse, one for glossy, and one for bump, we have one for the rust, one for the base metal, one for some kind of metal patches, that is one type of noise used for the rust areas, and then a noise grunge for the white areas, that is the scratches, and a dirt map. Of course, it's not as easy as saying you could bake all these textures inside the dirt map and that would be more efficient. Okay, we would have the dirt map, but then the dirt map would need to have a high enough resolution. So this dirt map that is 1K for each of these three, four gribble kits is quite enough for a very good detail. If I was to bake everything into the dirt map and make it into an actual texture, not just a control map, then I would probably need more and you could see pixels when getting closer to these objects. So there must be a point, if you have a very simple object, loading all these textures and blending them together will take way more memory than just baking everything into a single texture. You also have to keep in mind that you would have to do a diffuse, glossy and bump texture. This way you are getting the various textures by blending texture differently. So if this was just about a single gribble piece, well, with 1K for diffuse, 1K for glossy, 1K for bump, you're done. Free 1K textures and you're done. But if it's said to be three different gribble kits, then other objects and a complex environment such as the dome, all the tileables get reused. The dirt map is fairly low res and so it gets efficient for memory. The bigger the scene gets, the more efficient it is to use this kind of tileable and this overhead of having to do many blending operations then it's compensated by the fact that you're sparing overall memory and also another thing to keep in mind about performance you could use this technique in various other ways like if you are working on a game project then you might use real-time blending of textures like for a ground mesh where you blend two low resolution textures by a control map and you get sand and grass areas that's fine that's convenient even if the blending is done in real time in a game engine but if you are making this kind of gribble kits for a game engine blending all these textures to create the final material i don't think that would make sense you would instead probably do all this then bake it down everything to a uh, slightly higher res texture than the dirt map maybe and then maybe tweak it a bit by hand but still having this base as a fast way to create the, your base textures for your object for a game environment that would make sense too but anyway there are many many different ways to use similar techniques to this one and one last consideration about baking and matte painting i talked about baking same thing would apply about matte painting that what happened in the end in project mango cycles doesn't have a bake option and anyway there were many other aspects like global illumination ray tracing of glossy rays 
and not just a question of texture size and the material complexity. So in the end, the choice was to project on simple geometry and that's similar to what would happen with baking. Uh, if that was a proper bake with uh, the three channels and the material with bake textures, would have that been more efficient? That's a pretty good question and not easy to evaluate too. Uh, as I said, you need to test it on a big enough environment. So you would need to do something like the dome twice with different techniques, but looking exactly the same because the small differences in glossy amount and brightness of the material seem to affect the render time even more than having more or less blending operation, which sounds good for how bad the overhead of doing many operations of blending and having many layers is, then it should be good. In the end, it was chosen to do camera projection and matte painting for many other reasons. So this thing of the materials is a question, but was just one of many parameters in then choosing to uh, do matte painting and I guess that's really a lot to say about all this question, what's more efficient, what's the proper way of using this technique in a specific situation. But that's it for now. Hope you enjoyed this video.